I say welcome first or listen to music first? <laughs> Sorry, we all make mistakes sometimes, but it's all good because we want music and we want to welcome. So welcome to Arinda Community Church. Now you know something great is gonna happen any second. We're also excited to have the Reverend Pam Abbey here, who's gonna share with us during this month where we're celebrating creation and seeking creation justice. So it's a wonderful, even if it's a cold, it's a wonderful Sunday. So we want to remind you that no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, you are so welcome here. And with that, And now for my next act. <laughs> Please rise as you're able and join me in the call to worship. Let us pray for an end to the waste and desecration of God's creation. For access to the fruits of creation to be shared equally among all people. And for communities and nations to find sustenance in the fruits of the earth and the water God has given us. Creative and loving God, you created the world and gave it into our care so that in obedience to you, we can serve all people. Inspire us to use the riches of creation with wisdom and to ensure that their blessings are shared by all, that trusting in your bounty, all people may be empowered to seek freedom from poverty Amen. and repression.
please join me in the community prayer. O oh God, we thank you for this earth, our home, for the wide sky and the blessed sun, for the salt sea and the running water, for the everlasting hills and the never resting winds, for trees and the common grass underfoot. We thank you for our senses by which we hear the songs of birds and see the splendor of the summer fields and taste of the autumn fruits and rejoice in the feel of the snow and smell the breath of the spring. Grant us a heart wide open to all this beauty and save our souls from being so blind that we pass unseeing even when the common thorn bush is aflame with your glory. O oh God, our Creator, who lives and reigns forever and ever. So I invite you to take a deep breath or two as we claim this space every week to release all the stresses and worries of the week. You can feel your body lighten and open to the spirit. And you feel as the prayer says, the breath of spring coming in refreshing you and reminding us of the new life that God is constantly bringing our way. So join me for a moment in prayer. Our loving and constantly present one who restores and mends, we pray into the loss and waste, into the wrong-headed technologies and disordered ideals of our culture. Please help us to remember that we are plural and not single, singular. Please give birth so richly within us that we can remember the oldest of truths, that we are not separate from creation, from water, fire, air, soil. Healer, we are not separate from you. Let us live into this wisdom. We pray ourselves past brokenness and into your life. Amen. And may the peace of Christ be with you always. Scripture reading today is from Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, 
They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Good morning. I'm Reverend Pam Abbey. It is so good to be with you today. I am a retired United Methodist pastor, and I bring you greetings from the United Methodists of Walnut Creek, United Methodist Church. Um, I'm here partly because you have two good folk who play bells and show up at our church to play bells, and I see also one of our church members, Sharon Kirk, is here playing bells for you this morning, too. So. Um, it is good to be here, and I also went to Pacific School of Religion way back when, so I have some good UCC connections, and it's a very special place. So, if you think you may know what this gadget is, hold up your hand. Okay, two bell ringers know, because they heard this sermon before. Um, this is my plastic bag dryer sits right next to my sink. Um, I have been washing and reusing plastic bags for decades, I think. And honestly, if I had kids, the Ziploc bags would probably be family heirlooms. So our Lenten sermon series over at Walnut Creek United Methodist was Love in a Time of Climate Change, and it was loosely based on a book titled A Hopeful Earth. And when our pastor, Muntu Joshi, asked if I could bring the message on one of those Sundays, I asked what the theme and the topic would be, and he said, waste. My first thought was, oh, brother, I'm going to sound just like my mother. You remember those days? Clean up your plate. Remember the starving children in China. Well, my mom washed out plastic bags, at least some of the time, and she carried cotton handkerchiefs with her in her purse and threw them in the laundry at night. Now me, I carry a little packet of tissues around. For my mom, the watchword was frugality. For me, and probably for you, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. It's just a basic thing to try to do if you care about the environment. When I was in college, I had a poster up in my dorm room that said, live simply that others may simply live. I thought then, and I still do, that those were really great words to live by. But how simply do I live, really? It depends, I guess, on who I compare myself to. If I compare myself to Jeff Bezos, who founded Amazon, or Elon Musk, I guess I do live a pretty simple life, and I can pat myself on the back. But the fact is, I live a much richer and non-simple life than most of the world. Now maybe the rich man in this parable of Jesus that we just heard also thought he was living a simple life. Jesus makes it pretty clear he was not living a simple life. Even the word gate that is used here doesn't refer to a simple gate in a picket fence. It refers to a massive gate like you'd find in Beverly Hills. And the rich man dresses in purple robes, and purple was a very expensive dye back then. If he were alive today, he'd probably be wearing an Armani suit and driving around in a Lamborghini. And outside his gates sat this poor beggar, Lazarus. He was there every day. Now, this Lazarus is fictional, not to be confused with that Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. And the parables are little stories that Jesus told to make us think. And out of all the parables that Jesus told, this is the only character who's actually given a name. The shepherd who goes in search of the lost sheep, no name. The prodigal son, no name. The good Samaritan, no name. And none of the parables is a character given a name except for this poor beggar. And I think that tells us a lot about how God views poor beggars. It reminds me of one of my favorite verses back in Isaiah. I have called you by name. 
you are mine. Now the name Lazarus also means God helps. And I guess that's a good thing because the rich man didn't help much. It was a custom of the time for many people to put a little bench outside their home for the poor to sit on and wait for a handout. But the handouts generally weren't a lot. And this was a culture where people ate with their hands and one way of cleaning them, they didn't use cloth napkins, was to wipe their hands on bread crust and throw it under the table. And that's probably what Lazarus got. And then even after Lazarus and the rich man die and go to their respective rewards, the rich man seems to think that Lazarus should do his bidding. He says to Father Abraham, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. And then he asks Father Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers to change their selfish ways. And Father Abraham rather firmly declines to do that. Now one of the drivers of environmental problems, including climate change, is our overconsumption. We usually get more than we really need, and much of it goes to waste. And when we waste things, we're not loving our neighbor. And so this parable focuses on what we do with what we have. Are we using it to serve our neighbors, especially the Lazaruses of the world? And our waste leads to the degradation of the climate. A very fine sermon critic that I happen to be married to asked me not long ago, what does plastic have to do with climate change? Well, the answer is actually quite a bit. First of all, it's made out of petrochemicals. Fossil fuels are used in its manufacture. And then plastic doesn't really recycle. In spite of all those little triangles they put on things, it downcycles into a lesser quality of plastic. And down at the end of that downcycling are things like plastic straws and utensils and yogurt containers and plastic produce bags and takeout containers. And all of that turns into waste. Some of it gets incinerated, sending more carbon dioxide into the air, or it sits in landfills or gets dumped in the ocean. When it comes to climate change and other environmental concerns, everything is connected. It's more like a web. Whatever happens over here on one strand of the web shakes everything else. And when we create waste, we're not loving our neighbors. Now, some of you may have seen and remember the film Slumdog Millionaire. It came out in 2008. And it told the story of an 18-year-old orphan in Mumbai who found his way onto the TV show, So You Want to Be a Millionaire. And he kept winning. And lots of people thought he was cheating because there was no way a kid from his background could possibly be that smart. He grew up in a slum, specifically one of the garbage dumps outside of Mumbai. The film was a great hit. People found it inspiring. But we seem to forget that kids all over the world are growing up and in and around those garbage dumps. We find dumps like that in Cambodia and Indonesia and the Philippines and Brazil and Iraq. When you go home, Google garbage dumps in Google Images in one of those countries and you'll find plenty to look at. Folks go through the garbage looking for something they can sell for a few pennies. They create houses from scraps of metal and then they're generally built those little houses right there in the garbage dump. And when kids are old enough to walk, they're sent out to scavenge. And a lot of this is our waste. Don't ask me to explain the economics of why so much of our waste gets sent all over the world, but I haven't figured that out yet, but it does. It's like the rich man giving bread crusts to Lazarus. And it's not just in far-flung places that those sorts of things happen. One young woman began to put together the connection between her faith her neighbors, and the environment when she got to know a low-income community outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. The drinking water there had been contaminated with the illegal dumping of lead, arsenic, diesel fuel, and PCBs. So she joined a coalition that demanded clean water for the neighborhood, and through that, 
she began to understand that God's call to care for creation is the same as God's call to care for our neighbors. God designed the world to exist without waste. If you take humans out of the picture, there's no waste. Everything is consumed or it decomposes. Human trash, however, does not go away. Our habits, the things we do every day without thinking much about them, often do not lead to loving our neighbor. And I believe that includes our neighbors in nature. Our waste doesn't harm only human beings near and far. It also hurts our animal and plant neighbors. You know, a long time ago, I learned that a large number of, of indigenous peoples speak of animals as other than human persons. That's true for many of our Native American nations, also for other indigenous peoples all around the world. And that idea is not too far removed from the way Bible describes the gift of life. Because back in Genesis 2, we read, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the Hebrew word used there for breath is nephesh. And it is used to describe the breath and life of every other creature on earth too. Now some indigenous peoples also include other aspects of nature in this. <coughs> Rocks, trees, rivers, forests. In fact, in New Zealand, where the Maori influence is very strong, in 20, 2014, New Zealand granted legal personhood to the Te Urawawa Forest. The government transferred land ownership rights from the government to the forest itself. And in 2017, New Zealand did the same for one of their rivers. Recently, our pastor, Muntu Joshi, has suggested that rather than talking about our stewardship of nature, <coughs> we begin to think about our kinship with nature. And that sounds a lot like other than human persons to me. Consider our neighbor, the albatross. The albatross is among the largest of birds. It's an ocean-going bird. One albatross species has a wingspan of 12 feet. That's twice the size of a wingspan of an NBA player. They can fly for immense distances without ever touching down, being able to soar much of the time with little exertion of energy. The parents forage for hundreds of miles getting food for their chicks. And mostly they feed along the, ocean of the, sur the surface of the ocean for squid and krill and fish eggs. But in their search for squid, krill, and fish eggs, what albatross parents are scooping up these days are just plastic. Again, you can go home and Google images and find plenty of photos of albatrosses feeding their chicks brightly colored plastic. There's 22 species of albatross, and 21 of them are listed with some level of concern, everything from critically endangered to near threatened. And plastic waste in the ocean is one of the reasons. And you have this wonderful picture on your bulletin this morning of those fish created out of plastic pulled from the ocean waters. One of the things I learned in the last few years is that John Wesley, the founder of our Methodist movement, would be a pretty strong environmental activist if he were here today. John was a strong abolitionist, and he was good friends with William Wilberforce, who was the leader of the abolitionist movement. But Wilberforce also founded the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and Wesley helped with that and was a great supporter. Wesley wrote, the great lesson is that God is in all things, and that we are to see the creator in the looking glass of every creature. Even the actions of animals have a thousand engaging ways, which, like the voice of God speaking to our hearts, command us to preserve and cherish them. Reading that kind of blew me away. If I didn't love John Wesley before, I do now. So, you might be feeling depressed and maybe a little guilty when you think about our creation crisis. I know in our congregation, as we have focused on climate change recently, 
A lot of people have come to me to talk about how they should be doing more and how guilty they feel. What I'm hearing is I'm doing things, but I know there's other things I could be doing and I feel guilty. And to them I say, join the party. I do too. Guilt makes us uncomfortable. That can be a good thing because it can cause us to change our ways or make amends. But climate guilt is tough because we can never seem to do enough. To deal with that, I think we can go to the Apostle Paul. Now, a lot of us have this love-hate relationship going with the Apostle Paul. You know, we love passages like 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of mortals and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. But when I think about the state of the world, and especially the state of creation, I've gotten really fond of Romans 7, which is a lot of tough stuff about sin and not a lot of fun to read. But in that chapter, Paul says, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. And that kind of describes the dilemma we're in. We try hard to do right by creation, but it seems impossible. Now, I've been making war on plastic for years, but is my house plastic free? (laughs) Absolutely not. I can't get a prescription from the pharmacy without coming home with a plastic bottle. It's, I do the evil I do not want to do. And it's built into the system, just like systemic racism. I can strive to be as unprejudiced and fair as possible, but I still participate in that system whether I want to or not. So let me suggest instead of feeling guilty, we get a little mad. Good old-fashioned anger. Many of you can remember the days when young Christians were wearing those WWJD bracelets that stood for what would Jesus do. A lot of people made fun of it because it seemed so simplistic. I've come to think it's not that simplistic because sometimes it's pretty hard to figure out exactly what Jesus would do. But here, I think maybe it's a little simpler. I think maybe Jesus would just cleanse the temple. In this case, the temple of the earth. Because the systems are set up to make it hard to do the right thing. And for Paul, sin wasn't simply a personal thing we do, like robbing a bank or snapping at the grocery clerk. Sin was a cosmic force. It gets built into our systems, and that's very clear when we try to live a more sustainable life. One pastor had a church member who was working on legislation for waste reduction, and that church member told him, we cannot recycle our way out of planetary disaster. Only changes at the corporate and public policy levels will divert the disasters before us. And often cultural shame aimed at individual consumers, you and me, functions to shift our attention from the actors primarily responsible for our creaturely creaturely survival. So we may need to try to tamp down our guilt and ramp up our anger. Here's an example of how we can do the wrong thing without even knowing it. My husband's family lives in Indianapolis. We go there a few times every year to visit. We really like to visit the Indianapolis Zoo. Uh, It's a really good one, very involved in conservation efforts, and it's something we could take my mother-in-law to. She just turned 99. It's a fine zoo, and one of their specialties is a collection of macaws, those brightly colored birds that live in Central and South America. So we attended a program about the macaws one day and we learned they're endangered and their numbers are dropping. And one of the reasons is the loss of rainforest, their primary habitat. We were told that one way we could help was to avoid eating pineapple. Now, I love pineapple. That was not good news to me. Most of our pineapple comes up from the south, especially Costa Rica. We don't get it from Hawaii. They keep it all. And in Costa Rica, enormous amounts of rainforests have been cut down to grow pineapples, and there goes the macaws' habitat. The rainforests are not just habitat for macaws, they're also known as the lungs of the earth because they breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. So, here I am, a lover of pineapple. I went to the grocery store maybe a few weeks after that, and there was fresh pineapple on sale. 
I checked the tag to see where it was from. Sure enough, it was from Costa Rica. And the tag said, sustainably grown. If I hadn't gone to the zoo and learned about the connection between pineapple and macaws and rainforests, I would have felt good about buying it because it said it was sustainably raised. So don't feel so guilty. Get a little mad. Now, looks like a number of us here are baby boomers. Remember when we were out in the 60s and the 70s in the streets being activists? Well, our joints may not let us go out in the streets anymore, but we have other tools. We have our vote. Check the environmental record before you fill out that ballot. We have our buying habits. We can boycott companies we discover are pulling the wool over our eyes. And if we have some money and some investments, we can do our best to invest in companies that do right by God's creation and not those who are destroying it. Now, the sermon series at our church I mentioned was based on the book, A Hopeful Earth. It's admittedly hard to stay hopeful sometimes, but we worship a God of hope, and we have each other. Individually, it's hard to feel you're making a difference, but when we join together in gratitude for God's creation and join in prayer and action, we can make a difference. And let us remember those words of Jesus, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The creation crisis is a mighty big mountain, but who is better equipped to move it than those of us who worship and serve the God who made it? Together, with God's help and faith in our Lord, we can move mountains. Amen.
This is our time of sharing joys and concerns. So you're invited to raise your hand or if you have something that's a little more private, um, feel free to write it in the little folder in your pew and put it in the collection plate or come over later and light a candle over here where we have a, a place for some kind of private prayer and meditation. And I have a number of prayers and messages to share this week. Um, Babs Winbigler let me know. We had asked for prayers for Kate Winbigler's friend, Marin, who was juggling a pregnancy and a cancer diagnosis and treatment at the same time. Her baby has been born and is healthy. So um, no name yet, but, or we may get that news, but we pray in joy for that new life and pray for Marin's ongoing healing and health, as we also pray for Bob's ongoing healing and health. Uh, I got a message from Anne O'Connell Nye, and she says, thank you so much for all the messages and cards and memories of, of Gary. She has not been able to respond, and I think you all will understand, since so many people in this congregation have gone through losses, and there are these times where you just don't have the energy to respond. But it is deeply felt, and she's so grateful. And we think that there'll be a service for Gary here at the church uh, later in the summer. So we'll let you know about that. Um, Eartha who's resting right now, is, has been really grieving the illness of her friend Farrell. So we pray for Farrell, who has a brain tumor and has chosen not to have any um, ongoing health interventions. So we pray in love for Farrell and support for Eartha. Um, Carrie Pothig is celebrating a birthday in Mexico. Fred celebrated yesterday, right? Today, today, happy birthday. One month exactly from surgery. So it's like a rebirth. Yes, we're so, so happy about that. And we welcome back Bill who was celebrating his birthday. Are there any other, any other birthdays? Did you have a birthday or are you just having a, something you want to share? Oh, happy birthday. Are you turning 21? A few times over? <laughs> you hope. Do you have anything you want to add? It, it will be my Half a century. You're middle-aged now, officially. <laughs> okay. Well, we know that Earth is going strong at 106, so you got a long road ahead of you, Peter. <laughs> we celebrate with you. He is indeed still in the game. So... Any other prayers that people would like to share or? Thank you so much to Pam for her wonderful sermon. Thank you so much to our. Thank you for our chancel bell ringers. Uh, Gail and I are delighted to welcome our old pal Jack Henderson from Massachusetts. We met as freshmen at Middlebury College in 1884, if memory serves. And we're sending Jack off on a tour of Northern California. We're glad to have him here. Welcome, very glad to have you here. Um, I wanna say, is, well, I wanna say thanks to Lonnie for flowers and work, which made John Thursby's beautiful memorial service, more beautiful. And also for Gail and Karen who helped with that. Yes. 
So after the service, our, our coffee hour will be up in the fellowship hall where delicious things left over from the celebration of John's life are and also photos of him, his grade school stamp collection, and many of his ties. So you will want to see that. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for being born within us each day. And we give special thanks for those who are celebrating birthdays this time of year. In spring, with things blooming and the air fresh and the rain persisting, please continue to nurture us and bring us into wholeness. We give thanks for the birth of Marin's baby, and pray for her healing and for the healing of all in our congregation who are moving towards greater health. We understand that that is sometimes a slower journey than we would like. So help us to persevere and to feel your guidance and care with us every step of the way. We give thanks for the many ways the people in this congregation share where we share resources and care for each other. So we thanks, give thanks for everyone who has supported Anne, O'Connell Nye, Nancy, and those who have had losses in recent months. We all go through these periods of loss, God. So help make the loss a time of unifying and loving, where we are woven stronger together. And as we pray for people in our congregation, in our immediate community, may our prayers keep stretching outward and outward. So that we are praying also for our brothers and sisters in Palestine, for the little child who was wounded in Israel by the missile from uh, Iran, for our brothers and sisters who are still struggling in Syria, Myanmar, Sudan, Haiti. Our world is vexed with suffering and trouble. May we insist on peace and continue to build it. We pray also, God, that we can understand those non-human persons around us, the trees, the forests, the deserts, the rivers, the ocean, and meet that life with our life in supporting it and growing it. We give thanks for Pam's wisdom that teaches us to move away from guilt and to an inspired and active anger that will protect what we consider most precious. As we go, God, we are often confused, not sure, what steps to take. And so we lean into the wisdom and teachings of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, so a couple announcements. Uh, we are still accepting donations to the Black Wealth Builders Fund and have gotten more than halfway to our hopeful $10,000 goal, so if you want to contribute to that and help a family start building uh, intergenerational wealth and own a home, then we most welcome that. Just put in a memo on your check, Black, Black Wealth Builders. I checked my phone, and next Sunday, it will be clear and sunny, and that means it would be an 
excellent time for us after church to go to the good table in El Sobrante and they have their first farmer's market on Sunday from 12 to 4 and we celebrate with our sister church what they are doing to build community and support local agriculture and um, they're planting justice nursery which will hire formerly incarcerated people. So um, put that on your calendar and maybe we can carpool. There's not just going to be produce, there's going to be food. So I think we want to go celebrate with them. Um, as we mentioned earlier, after the service, go up to the fellowship hall for coffee and refreshments with great thanks to Nancy and her family. Um, on the 26th, there are two events of our community that you're invited to participate in. I have uh, just published a book of collaborative with another poet, and we're going to give a reading at 7.30 in the chapel with another poet who's a translator. And my son Jonah is going to bring some of his art and put it up in there. So it's going to be a happening. This can happen in the 2020s. However, if you live around here and you don't want to come to the church, Victoria Rue has done a remarkable thing at uh, Rossmore. She gathered together women in Rossmore who had abortions before Roe versus Wade made it legal. She made a play based on what their stories were and that premiere will be happening at Rossmore on the 26th as well. So um, I've seen some parts of that and it's really powerful. So you have some great options on the 26th. Are there any other announcements? No? Um, I also want to mention, oh, okay, over to Bill. I'm gonna go down to Southern California briefly this week to see my mother and it will be the one year anniversary of my sister's death so I'm gonna spend a little time down there but I will be accessible and all of our Zoom groups will proceed as usual. Thank you. I just wanted to rise for a minute to remind you that next week we anticipate our interim pastor being here with us at service. Her name is Lindsay Fulmer. She'll be driving down from Oregon, signing the paperwork on Friday and trying to get involved in our church on that Sunday. So after church on Sunday, if you'd like to meet and greet, there'll be coffee and you have an opportunity to say hello. Thanks, Bill. And that reminds me, you're always welcome to sign up to bring coffee. And the paper for doing so with a pen beside it is on the table out there. So we look forward to welcoming Lindsay. Now is our time of giving. It's an important time in the service. It's our time of recognizing all that we have been given by God and that we have the capacity to give back. So this is a time of rejoicing, and I invite you to rejoice in your giving.
Our loving and generous God, look at this abundance. May we use the overflow from our own lives as a witness to you and employ it to bring where we have so much riches and care and sustenance to where there is lack or starvation of spirit, soul, and body. May our Abundance become a way to address injustice and create a fuller, more whole world. We pray in gratitude. Amen.
reach with me into this atmosphere and feel how you are surrounded by clean, pure air and breathe it in. And in the richness of all that we are given, access to food and water and air and safety, we give thanks for God's goodness and we pledge to pass it on. May this be your blessing and your charge. May the peace of Christ always be with you and to be shared with all who surround you. Amen. Yeah. 